Hey guys, Courtney with Traps Fly Fishing, here to talk to you guys today a little bit about streamers. We're getting set up right now. I have Yvonne on the other end helping us run the live feed. If you have any questions right off the bat, feel free to start typing them in to um, the live chat box. Yvonne and I will be answering them throughout our presentation. Um, go ahead, log on, get set up, and we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in and joining us. Um, I know everybody's kind of hanging out at home or in a little bit different setting than normal. So we wanted to kind of get you guys a little information um, through some of our great social media platforms over this time. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing on streamers. A lot of people who I've talked to, have interacted with me, I'm friends with, know that this is a pretty intense passion for me in fly fishing, um, not only to do myself, but also to teach and talk about. So we're going to take the next little bit, probably about 45 minutes to an hour, um, hang out with each other, talk about streamers. I have my presentation going on the screen. Feel free to follow along. And again, for those of you who may have just joined, feel free to go ahead and throw questions in the chat box and myself and Yvonne, who's kind of behind the scenes, will get to answer them for you. So I always just like to start with a little bit about who I am, just so people have a little background on where I'm at, where I came from, how I got here. Um, so for those of you who don't know, my name's Courtney. I'm actually the Director of Education for Trout Fly Fishing. Um, love my position, love my, it's a complete class. Um, and I am obviously a huge angler. Um, I solidly got into angling going on, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Um, was into it a little bit as a kid, had a brother who was super into it. Um, and then it kind of came up in my life as I went through some kind of personal crises. And like for a lot of us, it became a getaway from me or for me. Um, what a lot of people don't realize though, is I no longer work in fly fishing full time. I'm actually in good old corporate America as well. Um, so I actually work in healthcare, ironically enough right now. Um, I help run pediatric home health agencies. So my life's been a little crazy, much like everybody else's. Um, but hopefully everyone's kind of settling in and adjusting to their new normal as we can and as we can go here. And again, thanks for coming and hanging out with us. So um, as we go through the presentation, um, we'll talk a little bit about on my agenda page here. Yvonne, if you want to switch pages. So when we're going through today, these are some of the different topics that I will plan to cover. Again, if you have questions, I'll stop every couple slides, try to kind of catch up with some of the questions in the inbox, but just keep sending them in. So we're going to go over the basics. We'll talk about some rigging specific to streamer fishing. We're going to talk about retrieves, um, the differences in streamer fishing in different conditions. And then also we're going to touch a little bit on cold weather tactics. Hopefully we're coming out of the cold weather, but it is a common topic I get asked about. So I definitely want to touch on that. So as we're moving along, um, first thing I'm going to start with, and usually what I like to start with a lot of my presentations with, is just like giving a background. So we're going to talk a little bit about what streamer fishing is, why it's a big deal, and then we're going to go into some big 
basic terminology and we'll kind of get into the meat of things after that. Uh, maybe bad pun not intended, but intended there. Um, so what's the big deal about streamer fishing? You know, historically kind of the big catch around streamer fishing is not only the fun of just throwing a big fly, um, having heavy leader, heavy fly, heavy rod, big cast, but also the intensity and the ability to kind of catch a big fish, hopefully. Um, so a lot of people stick around kind of the idea that, you know, big cray or big fish like big cray. Um, I think the thing for me that is that I've gotten into streamer fishing more is just for me, the big deal is the activity of it. Um, for anyone who knows me personally, you know that I'm pretty ADHD. So streamer fishing actually kind of keeps me interactive. It keeps me engaged, keeps me going. It's a very active form of fly fishing, which is great for me. Um, not only that, but the visual aspect of it, which we'll talk about a little bit, can be really addicting. Actually being able to see your fly move through the water, see how you're impacting that fly, and then you're actually able a lot of times to see the fish as far as the follow, the chase, the take. Pretty sweet kind of interaction to have. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, a lot of people already know this, but essentially a streamer is just a fly that's tied to imitate a small bait fish, a crayfish, um, other small items in whether it be lakes, rivers, whatever you may be fishing. Um, so you are typically dealing with a larger fly that again is a little more interactive. Um, as we keep moving along here, we'll talk about some of the basics and terminology. Um, some of this stuff I'm going to dig into a little deeper as we go along, so I'm not going to get heavy into it here, but I always just kind of like to talk with people on the front end to give them an idea of these are some of the main terms that you're going to be hearing about and we're going to be talking about. Um, so here's some basic definitions behind them. Um, so stripping line, a lot of people are super familiar with that. Big difference, obviously, in the different presentations, but like I was saying with my last slide, streamer fishing is a lot more interactive. And with that is the actual retrieve mechanism, which is stripping line. So when you place a streamer on the water, there's different ways that you can present it. You can fish it. Again, I'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, but the main way you retrieve it is through actually physically stripping your line. Um, strip set is actually the intention of setting the hook in the mouth. So when we're nymphing or we're fishing a dry fly, we're typically doing a tip set up towards the sky or down river or against current, depending on which way the fish is facing. But here we're actually going to use the action of stripping to set that hook into the actual little trout's or fish's mouth. Um, we'll talk about different types of streamers. So we're going to go over non-articulated versus articulated. What's the benefits of each? What's my preference? Um, we're going to talk about rigging, single versus tandem rigs. I'm going to go quite a bit into or further into rigging with details around what type of lines I use, what type of lines I recommend. Um, we'll talk about the actual physical types of lines. And then I do have a few specific lines actually listed in my presentation that I highly recommend and I also fish with. Um, we'll talk about terminal tackle a little bit. We'll talk about the benefits of regular leader versus sinking leader. And then a little later on, we're going to get into the difference between bumps and flash and takes, um, especially when we get into retrieves. So really quick, before I start getting into much rigging, let's jump over to the questions. Let's see what's going on, see if anybody has anything. Um, thanks, Yvonne. <laughs> I'm drinking water. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um... Let's see here. So I will definitely get into different types of streamers and colors. I actually have a full page coming up here a little further down in my rigging section talking about different streamers. I like to talk a lot about um, recommendations for people who are just getting into streamer fishing. I get that question a lot. If I have, if I'm trying to get set up, what are the first set of streamers that you would recommend? So I actually will talk about that a little bit in addition to color. Um, Irish coffee is not the answer, but keep guessing. <laughs> um, we are not only talking about high water fishing. I'm actually just going to talk about generalized streamer fishing. And then, like I said, I'll also chat a little bit later about um, streamer tactic changes when it gets into colder weather or different temperature changes in different seasons. All right. So moving into rigging. Um, these are recommendations. The thing I always tell people in my presentations is I'm not necessarily the all be out expert. This is just something I've taken a very intense passion for, for many years at this point. And I've done a lot of self-teaching, a lot of research. 
I have several books that I love that I've referred to. Um, I put myself around a lot of people who uh, spend a lot of time streamer fishing. And so um, with that, these are kind of the skill set I've picked up that I've found to be successful. A lot of the stuff I talk about today is basics. A lot of people know it. There'll probably be a few things for everyone, I hope, in here that's kind of like, oh, that makes sense, or I never thought about that, or what about this? Um, so anything that I'm about to present, like I said, it's not a, an answer to all, but these are the preferences that I have, and this is what I found to work for me. So from a rod perspective, we're going to be looking at typically a six or seven weight. Um, whenever I educate people on streamer fishing, of course, people always want to talk about, ask about first is what should I buy? Where should I start? I'm just trying to get into it. And there's a couple ways you can go about it. So if you're really just trying to feel it out, get a feel for what's going on, um, where's what, do I even want to get into this? You can, of course, use your standard good old trout nine foot five weight. The biggest thing with that is you're going to be limited really in the size of streamer you can fish, the, um, the weight of everything. So five weights can definitely get a small to, you know, lighter, medium sized streamer out there. But when you start to get in some of the heavier articulated streamers, they're going to overload your five weight. It's going to be sloppy. It's going to be hard to fish and hard to cast. Um, and typically by the time you step up or start to fish those streamers, you're already pretty streamer curious and you're pretty into it. And so at that point I say, go out and invest, um, go out and get the right equipment so that you can keep moving along. So if you were to come into the shop, say, Hey, I want to get set up for streamers. Um, and you were talking to me or one of the guys, we're going to kind of take you over and we're going to recommend a couple of things. So just starting with a rod, um, we are actually going to sit and we're going to recommend a six or seven weight to you. My typical preference is I try to push people more towards a seven weight only because it tends to be an all more all around rod. Um, when I started, I definitely started on a six weight and I loved it. I still have that rod. However, I've definitely progressed out of that. Um, typically when you get in seven weights, you're getting into rods that can be used fresh or salt water. And so they can be, have more dual applicabilities. You can take them on trips. You can use them here locally or in your local trout streams. Um, so I typically try to give people, if you're going to invest, let's go to that seven weight. You can use it across more things, more areas, more species, etc. Um, of course, with your rod and your setup, you do want to make sure you have an appropriately matched reel. There is a little bit of science behind that. So I always recommend when you come in, um, tell us what you're looking for. Tell us your intended purpose because we'll match the reel to the rod for that to make sure there's a good balance there. The one thing that starts to become important in streamer fishing, because you are usually chasing multiple species, you are usually chasing um, heavier fish, is now you want to make sure that you have a high quality drag. Um, depending on, you know, if you're getting into still water and you're talking pike and things like that, you're going to have a different level of fight and run um, and things like that. So where in our four or five weights, our trout, we may get a well-balanced reel um, that tends to be more purposeful and holding our line. Now the drag is going to start to matter. So you want to make sure that you invest in a good quality rod with a well-matched, good quality reel. Um, from a terminal tackle perspective, we're studying you up we're going to get you set up with some zero, one, two, and three apps typically um especially for us where we are here in colorado surrounding trout waters in our western states i spend a lot of time in that two to three x but there's definitely times when i go to bigger still water or i chase bigger maybe warm water species or like i said still water species that i'll drop down to whether it be you know bite wire if it's appropriate or zero and one x um the other thing we're probably going to talk to you about is a sinking leader so I get the question all the time, can I just use my standard leader? And you can when appropriate. And there's plenty of times that I stick with just a standard leader as far as, um, you know, just a typical mono non-sinking. However, there's a lot of periods where I will absolutely keep myself armed with sinking leaders. Um, I get out and depending on the flow and if I'm fishing from a boat or I'm on still water and I'm looking to get down, um, I have a floating line on. I'll go ahead and match that sinking leader to that floating line with the heavier streamer on the end to try to get down to where I need to be. I personal preference, I'm definitely more of a, um, I'm definitely more of a deep um, streamer angler. So I know that there are um, several people who definitely will believe more in a, um, top water streamer type technique, I tend to go deeper and I tend to get down more and that's where I tend to operate. 
Um, so we'll definitely talk to you about sinking leader. And then we're also going to talk to you about tippet rings. So when you're looking at a sinking leader um, and you're on the other end of that sinking leader, there's a little bit of mono core that's showing. Um, above that is PVC coating that's typically black or a dark green that creates the weight around your leader. And it's really important that you buy tippet rings to help make that sinking leader actually sustain and last longer. So you're essentially going to put a small little couple millimeter tippet ring on the end of that exposed mono core, and then you're going to tie your tippet off the other end of the tippet ring. That way you create a strength point. And if your leader is going to break, it's typically going to break at that tippet ring. So it doesn't break into your sinking leader. Um, that sinking leader, once you cut into it and you get up into the sink portion, they just are always the best as far as operation and um, actual purpose. And so you want to make sure that you're not cutting up into it and you want to preserve that leader as long as possible. Um, let me check in on the questions here. Rolling rock, still not correct. Joseph, we can definitely talk about sharing the slides. I also have some um, summary pages that I'd be happy to send out. I'm going to put my email on at the end of this presentation. So you're welcome to shoot me an email if you're interested in information and I can help get that to you. Eight weight, yep. I definitely fish in eight weight quite a bit too. I do that especially because I do a lot of switch between fresh moving water and still water. Um, and so that eight weight really can transition into still water really well, especially with high wind areas and trying to cast. Do roll casting in tight places. I have a real hard time during our streamers on the roll. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, um, for as Keith, I'll talk a little bit later about casting as well. All right, so moving into line. So there's three main types of line that we're going to focus on, um, floating, sink tip, and full sink. Um, we'll start with floating. You guys can kind of take notes on here. Like I said, I have some specific names for some different lines on here that I am a big fan of. Um, there's plenty of good lines around. These are not end all be all, but they're definitely ones I fished and I am in support of and I very much like. So floating line is just simply your typical line. It's the one that if you have your standard trout rod or your standard fly fishing rod, you probably have a floating line on it. It's probably a weight forward, four or five weight, depending on matching to your reel. Uh, or your rod, I'm sorry, um, and you can absolutely use a floating line. Even if you're going into that six, seven, eight weight, you can still put a floating line on there and you can make it appropriate to work. What you really need to match your line to is kind of the environment you're in. Are you fishing still water and you're trying to get out off the ledge and you're trying to actually sink past the ledge? You know, um, a sink tip or a full sink line with even possibly a sinking leader, depending on the conditions, are going to be kind of your go-to. Are you in a boat? Are you waiting in a um, lesser CFS trout stream? You might just stick with your floating line and then adjust your leader accordingly. Um, so like I said, there's a couple mentions of different floating lines on here. Not an end-all be-all, but ones that I definitely have had really good success with. Um, so moving on from there, we're going to go into sink template, sink tip lines. Um, so sink tips are a good go-to. I always tell people when I go to the river typically and I have my streamer set up, I'm going to have um, two spools typically with me. I almost always have my sink tip line on my reel that I'm using and I typically have a floating line with me um, in case I would need to switch out. Um, but sink tip is essentially your floating line with a sinking portion to it. So the initial portion or the terminal end that you would connect your leader to actually has a sinking quality or a weight to it. Um, what these are super nice for is they're really easy to pick up out of the water, whether you're waiting in the water or you're in a boat to actually pick up and cast. Um, you're not trying to pull the weight of an entire sinking line up against water resistance to pick up, to haul, and to lay back down. Um, when you're streamer fishing, you typically are doing kind of a one haul cast. You're not doing a lot of false casting just due to the size of the streamers and the weight of the streamers. Um, so you're really looking to try to get it up and get it down and keep it moving. So it's important that you can pick it up really easily and really quickly to get it up, get a solid cast. If you need to adjust your length, get it back out there, get it down and keep moving and covering water. Um, so kind of like it says on here, ideal for wade fishing, casting to the bank or pocket water from a boat as well. Um, the Sonar Titan Sink tip is actually one that I personally use and absolutely love. Again, not an end-all be-all, but something I highly recommend. 
moving into full sink lines. Most people are super familiar with these, um, whether it's from yourself, from Stillwater, from grandparents, parents, dads, whoever it may be. Um, they're a pretty classic line. What's been great about them in the past however many years is, of course, like everything else, the technology on them has improved. So when you're looking for sink lines, typically when you're looking for that full sink, now you're going to look at like a triple density line. So in other words, although the entire length of the 90 feet of line is full sinking, the density varies throughout the line. Um, so for instance, I have the sonar triple density um, I-3-5, so it's a intermediate sink, and then the next portion is three inches per second, and then five, um, so they vary in density throughout. The benefit to this is, A, it is easier to pick up and cast because, again, of the um, varying densities allows a little better flow and lift through the water resistance, but additionally, the thing I like about them is you get a more natural sink. So if you have one full sink line, if you think about it, it's going to be kind of dead weight straight to the bottom. Your fly is obviously being pulled down with that as well. However, if you have that triple density or that changing density, you're going to see kind of a more natural sink like this. Your fly on the end, it's not just going to be kind of that dead drop. It's going to be a nice natural. You can get some more natural movement through your fly, whether it's through a sink or on retrieve, um, and it's going to impact it both ways positively. So if you're going to look at full sink, definitely get into the triple density lines. Um, we can talk you through that in the shop. We're happy to do it online right now since I know the shop's not physically open with everything going on. But you can definitely jump on our website. You can live chat with somebody. You can get online. We're selling everything online, so we, can, we will gladly help you with that. Um, while Yvonne is changing that, will 4X be enough for medium-sized streamers? Um, it can be. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I typically tell people that it's important to go a little bit bigger on your tippet too, because just like I was saying in the beginning, where it's really important or it's um, addictive for people because they're typically chasing bigger fish. You also, just like with standard fishing, want to be friendly to the trout. So if you're fighting a bigger fish, you may not want to fight it on smaller tippet. It's safer for the fish. Um, you're going to be more likely to snap your flies off depending on kind of your casting level and skill set um, on lighter tippet as well because the fly is heavier. It does take a little more um, focus and skill to get a good loop, have a consistent smooth cast. Um, Kelly got up two to three inch leader length or um, leader lengths. I vary them. Um, so there's a lot of different feels on this. There's a few things in my presentation that I always tell people are polarizing in the streamer world. Um, and I feel like leader links is kind of one of those. Um, I do typically depending on, well, I, let me start with, I adjust them based if I'm doing a standard leader or a sinking leader with tip it off of it. Um, and I do base it on kind of where I'm at with sink, whether I go shorter or longer. Um, I don't typically go as short as like two to three inches, but I will go shorter like four inches. And sometimes I will still go up to, um, you know, multiple feet, like six feet, depending on where I'm at. And again, the sink range. So you kind of have to match your environment to the water, to the physics of something actually sinking through the water quickly versus slowly. So I adjust my leader based on all of those items, conditions, environment, you name it. Um, Jake, Maxima 2010. Yeah, I do definitely actually do um, quite a bit of leader building out of Maxima. Um, my fiance actually is really big in that too. So I did not use to until I met him, but he's done quite a bit to teach me on that. And now it is something that I use as a go-to, especially in still water, um, just a straight Maxima line. Sometimes I'll taper it depending on where we are. Sometimes I won't. So um, sinking leader, same as fluoro. So no, so sinking leader actually has a coating to it. Um, it'll come typically, like I said, in a black or like a dark green coating, and it's actually added weight to the, um, it's actually added weight to the um, mono line underneath. So think of kind of that outside covering on your fly line. It has a similar fly or similar covering to that, except it's over the mono core. So with it, like I said, it adds weight and it adds a greater sink. Um, and then you have a better sink. Your flies get down faster and lower. So um, so it is a little different than fluoro. Um, sorry, my, I apologize. My uh, 
computer just locked out with my presentation, so give me a second. I apologize. All right. Um, we're gonna roll it. All right, so next thing we're gonna talk about is the non-slip knot. For me, this is a game changer. People kind of sometimes look at me like I'm crazy, um, but I do think that this is a very impactful thing to learn. So when people are first getting into streamer fishing or getting into fly fishing altogether, I know knots can be super intimidating. Um, I always tell people, go home, bar, go to, pick up like a, a spool of just tippet, get a standard tippet spool of like 1X, 2X, something thicker that's easier um, for you to grasp and use and see. Go home, pour yourself a nice glass of whatever you prefer. For me, it tends to be whiskey. Um, sit at your counter and just practice knots. So um, get through them, learn them. You're going to be thankful when you get out on the side of the river and you're trying to get everything rigged up and you're stressed and you're seeing fish and you're seeing people get to the river and you just want to get to the river and you're trying to get your knots, get them down at home in a calm, peaceful, focused place and it'll make your life much better on the water. Um, with that, one of the knots I always tell people to move to is move away from your um, standard clench knot and get to your non-slip knot. Um, I think, Yvonne, if you can play it, I actually have a link on here for what the non-slip looks like. Um, and if we can um, try to play it here, it'll walk you through it. Um, this is the great thing about this knot. A lot of people know the slip knot from saltwater. Um, guides will use it essentially when the fish sets on that hook. Um, the knot will slip down. It'll cinch or clench onto the eye of the hook. This one actually creates a loop um, and it keeps that space between the eye of the fly and the knot. So when you see this picture, you can kind of see the knot there about an inch or so above the eye of the fly, and that creates a loop in between the two. Um, if you get online, you can actually Google non-slip versus clench knot, and there's a really good video posted somewhere on the Google um, of two flies and a fly tank that actually show what the difference in movement looks like um, between a fly that's attached with a non-slip versus a fly that's attached or a streamer specifically that's attached with a clench knot. It's amazing seeing them in the tank, how much that knot changes the natural motion of the fly. Um, I was eye opening for me when that happened. Um, and so um, I changed to this and I do as a, like we often get to in fly fishing where we kind of get a sense for things. Um, I can tell the difference in my movement, the more natural presentation of my streamer. The big thing about streamers that we have to remember is we are what's putting the natural motion into the end of that or through the line, through the leader and into that fly. Um, so where you're trying to drift a nymph more naturally, um, this nap, the naturalness, naturalness, the word, the naturalness in the fly is created by us and the type of strip, the speed, um, the adjustments we make. So having this extra little space between the eye of the fly and the actual knot allows just a little additional natural movement to create a more natural fly and hopefully better takes. Um, Women, yes, that's what has made a huge difference for me and advice on how to make the loop knot. Yeah, um, so this is from Opportunity Fishing. Yes, non-slip um, made a huge difference for me. Any advice on how to make the loop smaller for smaller flies? I have never, I never have issues on big flies that have trouble on smaller flies occasionally. Um, it's really just a matter of practice. So I always tell people with this, um, typically you want the knot about an inch from, or the loop, and then the subsequent knot about an inch from the eye of the fly. However, you never want to go bigger than half the length of your fly in this knot. That's my recommendation. Um, getting to that half mark or bigger, what you'll end up seeing is your flies actually flip onto themselves. They flip through the knot, and obviously you no longer have a functional fly if it's folded back on itself or it's wrapped up in the loop. Um, the biggest thing that I learned is when you go through, you do your overhand knot, you put the tag in through the eye, you come back, adjust that little overhand knot down to where you actually would like it to end up or just above there. So when you come back down, you lubricate and then you pull. This knot doesn't have a ton of movement like when you clench down a clench knot. 
So kind of where you set your little overhand loop is where the, um, the knot's gonna sit and then create the length of your loop. So I always kind of drive from the spot where that overhand loop is actually sitting. Um, does any loop not work? It can. I've definitely heard people talk about it. Um, this notch has been proven from a strength. Um, I haven't used a lot of other loop knots to, from personal experience to give you a bunch of recommendations and comparisons. I do get this question a lot, so I feel like I should probably do some R&D on it so I can speak a little better to it. But yes, I have heard of plenty of people who use other loop knots as well um, based on what they know and they work fine for them. Um, the attention of this knot and the research behind it on strength is just kind of my go-to. Um, hi, Courtney, would you recommend anything drastically different when using a nymph rod with small streamers, Euro nymph? Would you recommend micro Skagit Commando Sync? I'm going to be really honest with you. I have no idea. That is not something I have experience in. Um, Yvonne might be able to jump in and put some recommendations in there, um, but I would not not be the one to answer that, but I can definitely try to get you some information um, after the talk about that for sure. Yeah, you can use a non-slip knot for anything. I actually have seen people use this knot in their nymph rigs um, with tags off of their actual rig itself. They'll do a tag, they'll do a non-slip onto a nymph or their terminal fly, they'll do a non-slip there. So I've actually seen this um, not used in a lot of different formats. Um, it doesn't matter your size of your streamer, you can absolutely use it for all streamers. Non-slip not for smaller. And then Corey, I think I just kind of answered that too. So let's talk a little bit about flies. Um, so again, we get into streamers, they're big, they're sexy, we love them, we love to see them in the water, we love to see the fish that chase them. And so everyone says, so where's your biggest articulated fly? I want that big movement, that big fish. Um, so there's two main types of streamers. There's articulated and non-articulated. Um, essentially what we're talking about here is articulated is gonna have a joint in the middle and have two sections. There's gonna be single articulated and double articulated depending on what fly you're looking at. Um, I should have totally brought my streamers in. I don't know why I didn't even think to do that, so I apologize. Uh, but when you're looking at a single articulated fly, there's gonna be two sections or two hook shanks. They're gonna be um, joined by um, some material, like not total thread, but thread-like material to create some movement. And then there's gonna be a hook off the tail end or the second section. Um, when we're talking double articulated, each section, each hook shank is actually going to still have the bend of the hook with the point on it. So you're going to have double hooks. Um, again, the articulation is just the fact that it's jointed right there in the middle. Um, and naturally with that joint, you get a little more natural movement and you can get a little better presentation. Um, also, what you can see with articulated, depending on the material, is how much water they push. So especially when you're in still water, you're looking at warm water species, they're looking for vibration in the water, they're looking for water push. And when you have that double articulated, double material, you can get a much heavier, at times, water push um, throughout the water, catch a little more attention. Um, that being said, I use single, non-articulated flies and mirrors on the regular. Essentially, that's like the one that's actually here in my presentation. In the picture, it's just a single hook and shank, and the streamer's tied directly onto that shank. Um, a lot of times when people are first learning streamer fish, I'll actually push them into non-articulated. It is an adjustment to cast an articulated. So I tell people get comfortable with a standard streamer, especially here in Colorado on some of our smaller trout waters. You're going to be just as, as successful with a smaller streamer um, as you are with some kind of big um, articulated or double articulated um, movement. It's just knowing the right streamer as far as um, what's seasonal, seasonally correct, color correct, and then size correct, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, the biggest thing to remember, like I have noted on here, is your strip matters no matter what you're fishing. Whether you're fishing articulated, non-articulated, double, single, it doesn't matter. You are the movement within that streamer. And so you need to make sure that the movement you're creating is natural for that. Um, it's no different than if you're nymph fishing and you're trying to get the best kind of drift under your indicator. You're trying to get your bugs in the right water columns based on where they actually live, what's from an entomolo entomological perspective, what's correct. Same thing with a streamer. 
What am I trying to imitate with my streamer? What would that look like um, when it's in the water? How would it swim? Where would it swim? And now this streamer is imitating that. So I need to get it to the right spot and make the right movement. No different than any other technique of fly fishing. Um, Steve Segura, what's up, buddy? Yes, use the non-slip anytime you want to add movement. Absolutely correct. All right, so moving on from articulated versus non is um, another mantra of mine, which is bigger isn't always better. I think, again, like I was talking about earlier, um, that people get into streamer fishing, they want those bigger fish, they want those bigger takes, those big eats, whether it be more on the top water, below surface, subsurface, further down, they want that big grab. Um, but you don't always have to do a bigger streamer in order to get that reaction and that grab. When we're streamer fishing, we're really aiming to hit up those, those whatever species it is, trout, pike, whatever, the territorial senses, um, as well as that reactionary sense. So when you're aiming to hit those, you're typically going to get the more explosive and reactive reactions and takes. It doesn't always require a massive six inch pike streamer in order to do that. Um, you can get some really solid eats from a nice 16 inch brown or rainbow um, on a non-articulated woolly bugger too. So it's not always bigger is better. Just like I was talking about kind of on the last slide, it's really important that you match your environment just like with any fly fishing style or interaction. So know again, what you're trying to imitate, what lives in that water, how it looks, what's the general size, color, shape, match the hatch per se, match the streamer per se, um, and go at it. So if that means that it's little crayfish, crawdads, you know, you're trying to, they're this big, don't be putting a streamer on this big in a water that you need something this big. Um, it, along with the bigger isn't always better, um, this is where a lot of people talk about short striking, or I'll have people ask me, like, I hear about a short strike. I don't really understand what it is. You've probably experienced it if you've streamer fished, and you probably have been frustrated as all get out because of it. Um, essentially, what a short strike is, is the fish is following the streamer, and essentially what they do, um, but the they are going to bite at the tail of the streamer, um, and they're short striking it. So you feel a bump, you go to set, and then there's nothing there. There's no tension. There's nothing there. You're casting, you're hitting, you feel another bump, you set again, there's nothing there. You're like, what is going on? This is really frustrating. I might use some other choice words, but right now we're just going to use the word frustrating. Um, what that means is the fish is short striking you. So again, they're not actually inhaling it all the way. They're tapping at it. They're um, getting at it. They're trying to get it out of the way. It's clearly annoying them, but they just have not gotten enough of a bite over that streamer and therefore that hook to actually create an effective hook set with the hook in the mouth. Um, things I always recommend to people when this is happening, um, is to either, if you are feel comfortable with it and you have enough of a supply, always feel free to trim the tail back to get a little closer to the hook so that when the fish goes to bite on that tail or goes to take it in and hail it, blow at it, whatever it may be doing, bumping it under the water, um, you're more likely to actually get the hook set within their mouth. Um, or you can lessen the fly size. So if you have one of your favorite fly, you don't want to trim the tail, try going into your box and finding something that's similar. If you know that color shape size is working similar, but just go down in size. Um, moving through, let's see here. Um, Micah, how do you make a streamer look realistic on fast water? I'll go over that in a little bit when we talk about different presentations. Um, okay, Yvonne, can you switch slides for me, please? <laughs> Got it. Um, all right, so continuing to talk through um, rigging options. So we talked about articulated versus non-articulated. Let's talk about single versus tandem streamers. Um, I always preface this spot in my presentation to tell people I am not an expert at tandem stringer, streamer fishing. It's not something I participate in a lot. I'll talk to it a little bit, um, but I don't necessarily have all the information in the world by any means on tandem streamer fishing. I do tend to stick in that single streamer option. Um, and essentially single streamer is exactly what it sounds like. It's one streamer um, attached to the end of your leader or tippet, your leader. 
um, rigged at the end. Typically, I'm like I said, I'm doing it with a non-slip knot. A tandem streamer, I have a picture here that's showing on the screen. These are kind of the two primary ways to do tandem streamer rigs. Um, much like nymphs, you have a couple different options for them. That top one you can see is actually um, eye to hook bend and then to eye. The bottom one is double off the, the front streamer's eye. So the things I tell people about tandem streamers are a couple things. Um, a, please make sure you space them apart enough. What you don't want to do is have a fish come up and eat your, go after your first streamer and that back one wraps the fish or hooks the fish. So 18 to 24 inches in between is definitely um, highly recommended by me. Um, I know we all love to say a lot, but most of us are safe on our fish. If we're going 18 to 24 inches in between, um, you're going to be less likely to foul the fish with your back streamer. Um, additionally, do not do two, art two double articulated flies. Typically, your first fly is going to be a um, single non-articulated streamer. If you're going to do an articulated off of it, make your articulated on the back. Um, and then your front fly is always going to have clinch knots, eye and hook bend or double eye. If you're going to put a um, non-slip and put it on your trailing or your terminal streamer um, to give it more movement. There's a lot of different theories around tandem streamer fishing. Um, a lot of people have theories around which size to put first versus last, color, chasing the other. The theory behind it generally, in a very general sense, is predator prey. We have prey, we have predator chasing, and then we're going to get a bigger predator to come and take those. So it's more movement. It's more, hopefully, annoyance, um, kicking off territorial senses and a potentially a bigger fish. It's hard. It can be hard to cast. Um, you need to be more aware of your cast. You're more likely to catch yourself, your buddy, the tree, or something else around you. Um, so make sure you know what you're doing. Be very careful. Crimped barbs. Um, anyways, always, but definitely in this case. Um, and let me know how it goes for you, I guess. Like I said, I have a lot of success with single streamer. Don't spend a lot of time in the tandem, but it is definitely a possibility and a technique. Um, let me look here. Tinkara specific. <laughs> um, thanks, Steve, for the question. I, I'm not a Tinkara expert, so I can't speak to that. Um, maybe Yvonne wants to speak to some Tinkara streamer fishing over there for us in the background while I keep moving on. <laughs> um, when to make a change? Another common question. I think this is just a common question in fly fishing in general. Um, whether you're nymph fishing or dry fly fishing, how long do I fish it? When do I know? How do I know? How should I change? What should I prioritize? Um, this is kind of how I go through it with streamer fishing. Um, obviously some of it's going to determine, or some of it's going to be based on how I'm fishing. Am I waiting? Am I covering a lot of water in a boat? What are the conditions? Um, do I know it's fall or spring where fish tend to be more heightened? Um, and it's not a super hot day or a super cold day. I know the fish are moving. I'm not getting much reaction. Or is it a colder day where I know the fish are going to be maybe slower to move or more picky on what they move on? Um, I may change less frequently or more frequently there. So when you decide like, hey, I feel like I need to change. This is what I tell people. Um, like I was just saying, let the conditions dictate first. Seek to understand the fish, the behavior they're in, the waters you're in, what's around, understand the temperatures, how that's impacting things. Um, and then when you decide a change is needed, start by doing these three things. And I typically do them in this, this setup order, one, two, three. Um, so first start by changing the speed of your retrieve. So just try changing the presentation and the movement through the streamer itself. Um, sometimes just changing the speed of your retrieve will get that fish's attention or will change things. Um, that may mean, I see a lot of people when they first get into streamer fishing, they're super excited about it, rightfully so. Um, they really want that eat, they want that bump everybody takes and they're really, really excited and they're sitting there and they're speed stripping. Probably not necessary. Um, think again, think back to what you're imitating. How would that naturally appear in the water? Is it speed swimming? Probably not. Also, is that item, um, on a consistent, like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three movement. Again, probably not. Typically bait fish, things like that. They're moving, they're sitting, they're fleeing, they're coming back, they're getting flushed. 
So their movement themselves naturally changes. So don't be afraid to change up your retrieve as a result. You may move a bit faster. You may do slower strips. You maybe do a couple quick strips. Also, I always tell people, pause. Don't be afraid to pause between strips. Let that streamer sit and sink a little bit, give a little natural movement with the water, seem like it's dead drifting or it's shocked, and then add a little movement. A lot of times right after that pause and that sink with the next little movement, that's when you'll get your bump or your strike. Um, after you change speed, if that's not working, change the depth of your retrieve. Are you where the fish are sitting? It doesn't matter what technique you're fly fishing. If you're not in front of the fish or around the fish or within their view, you're probably not going to get a fish. Are you where the fish are? So change your depth. You can do that, obviously, with changing the weight of your streamer. You can do that with how much time you're pausing to let it sink. You could do that by changing your rig, by changing the length of your leader, doing a sinking leader, um, change whatever line you may be using, but change your depth. Finally, if those aren't working, that's when I'm actually typically going to go and I'm actually going to change the streamer and I'm going to change the color of the streamer. Um, this often brings up the age-old question of what colors do you fish and what are your favorite streamers? Um, so Yvonne's on the other side and he's going to be cringing while I say this. This is not his gig, but I stand hard <laughs> in my belief that I am an olive streamer believer. So... I always start with olive, I move to white, and I end with black. Traditionally, most people are black, ride or die. They stick with their black, they go to white, and a lot of times olive is less. I am a believer in olive streamers with a little flash, typically articulated, just throwing that out there. Um, there is a truth and confidence fly. So find what you believe in, find what you have success in, no different than your dries and your nymphs. There is a truth in fly fishing to confidence in your presentation and how you fish things. Um, and I am a confidence believer in all of streamers. So I love me some all of streamers. I'm sorry, Yvonne, but I do. <laughs> um, would you ever use an indicator? Um, when I use an indicator, um, I'm typically done drifting a small leech or something under an indicator as part of my nymph rig. Um, I have not used an indicator around, behind, above um, any kind of traditional streamer, but I do absolutely dead drift small leeches, things like that, on, especially on some of our tailwaters um, and free stones for that matter, uh, here in Colorado um, when it's right and when it's appropriate time of year, the right environment, and definitely have had success with that. Um, dark day, dark fly, bright day, bright fly. That is an old adage and a, tr a saying. I'll be real. I don't buy it, um, but I get argued with on that all the time. I say, do what makes you confident and fish what you believe in because that's what's going to catch you fish. Um, I, I live in olive, whether it's dark or light out, So, and I catch fish. So um, I know that that's definitely something people live and believe in more power to them. For me, I say just fish the dang streamer. So um, let's talk about some basic streamer examples. So I talked earlier about a lot of people ask, hey, I'm getting into this. What should I buy? What should I look at? Um, what are you thinking? If I'm going to come in the shop or I'm going to go to the shop or right now I'm going to shop online, you should totally do that, by the way. Um, what should I buy? Here's a good setup of just some good streamers. Um, I have them listed by single articulated, double articulated. Um, and then again, coming back to the colors, believe in your confidence fly. But if you're just learning, you're going to a new water, shop local people. Call the local shop to that area. Streamer fishing has become extremely popular over the last couple of years. So just like a fly shop can give you a water report, temperature, weather, they can give you a streamer report. Like, hey, I want to hit your water next week. Are streamers hitting? If so, what would you recommend? Color, size, so on and so forth. Um, and then Shop at that local shop. Pick up some streamers from them. Support local. So um, definitely don't be afraid to check in and ask. There's the dark day, dark fly, bright day, bright fly. Um, like I said, just fish the dang streamer. Um, at the end of the day, trout on the prowl for big food are going to take something. Um, if it's in the right level and you're getting to the right spot and you're triggering that territorial reactive sense. Um, I don't believe a trout is like, well, that streamers olive and this one's white um, one may catch their attention more yes I agree with that I think that there's a lot to be said um, 
about, again, the movement you put in it and the amount of water it's putting or moving um, in front of that fish in order to get those senses kind of heightened and that reaction to come out. Um, next up, I have a couple slides of just fish because who doesn't like fish? Um, this I put these in here for my presentation because this is what I love to show people about streamer fishing is the fact that it is so um, diverse. You can use it so many places. Um, Yvonne, can you change the slide for me, please? Okay, so um, when you're looking at this first slide of photos up in the left-hand corner, it's a bull I caught up in British Columbia, um, top right, that's up on our good old Colorado River um, outside of Denver on the upper Colorado. Um, down below, we have a pike from a couple of years ago. Um, down bottom right corner, um, native cutthroat, again, up in Canada. Um, moving to the next slide, we have some good still water stuff. So um, we have wiper, we have bass. Down in the bottom left corner, um, that's a redfish from my most recent redfish trip this past October. And upper right corner, that's actually down on the gunny. Um, so what you can see between these slides, streamer fishing is so versatile and you can take it so many places. So kind of wrap back, to wrap back around to what I was talking about in the beginning when you're talking about setups and rigs. Um, I want to get you into a rod that you can use across to everything um, because the take of a bass or a wiper or a redfish versus a trout, they are all incredible and stuff that everyone should experience in their fly fishing lifetime. Um, look good fish. <laughs> yes, Steve, definitely look good fish. Good. Chartreuse. Yeah, there's definitely times I use chartreuse flies. I'm in still water. I'm in the Clouser realm. Chartreuse, chartreuse all day long. Um, do you use the jerk strip retrieve? I'm actually about to get into retrieves, Jerry. So we'll talk about that. <laughs> I have no idea, Davis. That's a very hidden private water. So pump house is just, uh, I don't know. I keep hearing about it, but I don't know where it is. Um, split shot. Yeah, this is a good, um, question. Again, something that comes up very frequently, um, while we have this slide up, let me just touch on first crimp your barb always. I talked about it a little while ago, um, but it still holds true. It's, it, I mean, it's important always for fish protection, but please understand the importance of it in streamers. We're not talking about small hooks here. We're talking about hooks that can do legitimate damage, rip, tear, bleed. Please debarb it, not only for the fish, but for the back of your head, your shoulder, and your buddy fish, fishing next to you. So always crimp your barb. Um, as far as split shots go, um, I personally do not use them. Again, I feel like this is another what can become a polarizing topic in fly fishing around streamer fishing. Um, I personally do not. My belief is that little bit of split sitting whatever distance from the eye of your hook changes the entire motion of the fly. You're adding weight in a different area off the fly and you're messing with the physics and the setup of that fly. Um, when I fish streamers, because I do tend to be somebody who believes in depth and getting down, I make sure that the streamers that I fish, um, whether they're tied at home or I buy at the store, I'm buying streamers that are balanced in the way they're tied and tied to be heavier. So whether that's a lead wrap around the shanks and they're balanced on an articulated, or it's a weighted cone head, um, in addition to the lead wraps, I try to get all my weight within my floor and I try not to mess with any of the action that could be posed by me into the fly by putting a split in front of it. Um, that being said, again, I know people who swear by split in front of their streamers um, and have a lot of success. For me, it's just not my go-to. Um, <laughs> Steve, I like that. Crimpin' 80 easy t-shirt. Make it happen, Trouts. Yvonne, you should write that one down. Write it down. Uh, let's get into um, let's get into casting. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. Um, the big thing to know is hauling. Um, as you get more into streamer fishing, you're getting into heavier rods that you need to load more. You're getting into heavier flies out there on the terminal end of your leader. Hauling matters. The ability to be able to pick up and do a solid haul to actually create the tension to load that rod to help you present and. Um, get that streamer out where you need it to present it in a well fashion is really important. We're not doing a bunch of false casting with streamer fishing. It's dangerous. You're wasting time as you could be covering water. Um, you just want to be able to get it up, 
tension that rod, load it, and lay it back out in a well-laid fashion. So being able to single and double haul with streamer fishing is a huge game changer and a definite advantage. Another plug, if you need help with this, um, once this quarantine has passed us all, we will be getting our casting classes back up and going. Um, we not only have group, but we do have private, and we'd be happy to work with you on this on a real rod outside at Little Cheeseman Park. So just throwing that in there, keep that in mind, but getting into hauling, understanding how to tension the line manually, add that extra tension is a definite game changer when you're throwing heavier rods, heavier lines and heavier flies. Um, so now getting into retrieves, um, I'm gonna talk about these four main retrieves um, and there are a million other ways to retrieve um, just as a preface. I feel like these are kind of your four core that you can work within and work around. Um, you have your basic retrieve. Essentially, if I'm standing here and um, I'm standing on one bank, the bank is directly in front of me where you guys are, upstream to my left. I think that's your right. Downstream to my right. I think that's your left. Um, I'm essentially just doing a straight lifting up. I'm laying it down at the other bank and my basic retrieve is just going perpendicular straight back to me. I may be putting different movements into the fly. I may be changing my speed or my length or the jerkiness of my retrieve. Um, depending on what I'm trying to represent, where I'm trying to get, but it's just a basic retrieve, straight up, straight down, retrieve straight back to me. Uh, the next one, 45 degrees down and across. So again, I'm here, banks there, upstream, downstream. I'm going to quarter my body at 45 degrees. I'm going to do a cast. I'm still going towards the bank on the other side. Um, and then I'm going to essentially, there's a couple different things you can do. You can still do a retrieve back from there. You can also essentially swing in at that point. Different beliefs on swinging, depending on where you're trying to get. You can definitely lay it out, big mend upstream um, or a big mend downstream. So it depends on how quickly you want it to sink, how you want it to present, where you're going with it. Um, if you're going to do a swing, um, one of the things I always tell people to focus on is making sure that when that streamer comes out of the swing, it's ending in front of where you think the fish is sitting. So I'll see a lot of people swing and I'll know where about where the fish should be sitting by reading the water. And at the end of their swing, the streamer has completely missed them. They're internal to the fish. They're stripping it back. It's not even within the fish's purview and sight lines, and they're not getting hits. Make sure that you understand your targets and where you wanna get, and make sure you adjust the length of um, not only your line and your mend, but also your swing to get that fly into their purview, into their sight line. So then when you come to take it, you'll get the actual take. Um, dead drift, also known as let it soak. Um, you can absolutely dead drift a fly. You do need to be cautious and aware of the depth of where you are versus the flies you're fishing. Obviously, if you have a heavy fly, a sinking leader, sink line, and you're trying to dead drift in this much water, you're just going to be sitting in the bottom and you're going to be not in a good place. So make sure you have the right setup. Um, we can obviously do it under an indicator, like I was talking about earlier, just dead drifting a small leech. But from a true traditional streamer fishing, just a simple cast out. Um, I'll do this actually a lot when I'm floating and we're covering water. Get a little what I call spaghetti in my line. So I have a little um, slack out there and I'll just kind of let it sit. Every once in a while I'll give it motion, give it a little fleeing or um, kind of coming to, stunning, coming to, stunning. It just got flushed. Whatever it may be um, can be a very effective retrieve and pattern. Um, finally, the one I talk about is the give and take. I always tell people this is not something I do, but it is a very legitimate retrieve. I have been with you a lot of success. It's just not something I've put a lot of focus on. Um, I often see it done in colder weather in a winter. Um, in the winter, essentially, um, if I am standing here and I'm in the river and let's say there's a boulder downstream or upstream from me, um, or sorry, downstream from me, I'm going to go ahead and lay out. I'm going to go behind that boulder and I'm going to do a little give and take. So I'm going to do a little strip and then I'm going to let it go. I'm going to do a little strip and then I'm going to let it go. I'm going to Give it back and take it back. Give it back, take it back. Um, just know that you're not staying in the one place when you're doing that. You're still progressively moving the fly back towards you. It's not like I'm giving, I'm taking, I'm, and it's just staying within the same foot area. It's still progressing back towards me. Um, however, through that progression, I'm giving it a little slack, I'm tightening it up, and I'm giving it some different movement. Um, big thing about retrieves, remember fish will follow your fly. I don't know, typically when I'm in presentations and I'm talking about this, I'll have people raise their hand in the room to say who has been fishing streamers 
they're, they're stripping, they go to lift their fly up and they see a fish come from the depths, the depths and chase their fly. And you're like, damn it. Um, fish follow streamers. I have had more than enough eats within six inches of the boat or six inches of myself at the end. Fish will follow them, monitor them, and then decide when it's right for them to kind of attack or pounce um, on that fly. So don't lift up too early. Don't get in the habit of lift, cast, strip, strip, lift, cast, strip, strip. Make sure you work that fly to fruition before you lift it back up to go to cast again. Um, next is just a really good recommendation. This is something that I learned pretty early on in my streamer fishing endeavors and something I like to share with people, something that people a lot of times don't think about. Um, but that is actually the physics of your rod in coordination with your strip. So on this slide, what you can see is there's actually two pictures there. There's one that says tip out and one that says tip in. Um, with the tip out one, you can actually see that it has an orange line on it. And what you can see at the end of the tip of that rod, between the tip of the rod and under the surface of the water, there is a little bit of orange line kind of free floating in the air. On the tip end, you can see the little um, like rings around the tip of the rod um, because the tip of the rod is actually in the water a couple inches. Um, and if you maybe get really close to your computer screen, you'll be able to see that that tip end one, there's actually a white line um, going through the water. What I always tell people is tip in. So when I'm out guiding or fishing with people that want to stream or fish with me or just go fish in general because I like to fish with people, it's cool. Um, what I will tell them all day is, you know, your typical guide is telling you all day, set, 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 get your tip up, set. I'm just saying all day, get your tip in, tip down, tip in, keep your tip in the water. Um, for me, the difference here is actually big. Similar to what I was talking about earlier, seeing the slight um, difference in natural presentation between a clinch and a non-slip knot, there is a physics difference in your connection um, between your hand and the line going down that rod and eventually to that fly. So with that tip out, with that little bit of orange line there in the air, it has a difference in friction. So we're going from water pressure and tension to air pressure and tension to then in the guides you're almost always gonna have just a slight bit of slack in that exposed bit of line between the surface of the water and the tip of your rod, not giving you the most pertinent and complete connection to that fly. Getting your tip in the water, you have a more consistent tension and resistance to that line, creating a more consistent um, strip and presentation and direct connection to that actual streamer when you're fishing. You're going to miss less fish and set on more fish. Um, so I always tell people to think of the basic physics, the changing of the environments, the slack in between, um, and get that tip in the water. Keep it consistent. Catch those fish. Um, margarita time. It's always margarita time. Um, roll casting. Oh, sorry. Hence on roll casting um, and turning that heavier streamer over if you're wade fishing in a tighter spot. Um, it's really just going to be about your tension and where your rod tip is. So um, I tend to kind of put a single haul into my roll cast um, and I would highly recommend kind of learning that little bit of a haul in your roll cast. So all your techniques are gonna be the same. The biggest thing I typically see with people in the roll cast when I'm teaching the technique is they forget to pause. So they get their tip up, they get it to that like one o'clock mark if 12 o'clock's at the ceiling, they get it to one o'clock and they just wanna go. Well, when you're up, keep in mind that your flies and your line are traveling through the water because your tip is dragging them there. You need everything to settle for a minute to get equal water tension so that you're casting against that water tension. That's even more important in this because the fly is heavier and you want to get as much tension so that you're having success with it. Um, also, control the length that you're trying to roll over. If you have a sink tip on, a sink line, you have a heavy fly, I mean, it's going to be a bear to get over. So make sure that you're putting yourself in all the correct positions, the right dynamics and physics to the length of the line, the weight, and then don't forget to pause at one o'clock and then go. Make sure it's one solid movement over. Make sure when you actually come across, or, or sorry, over in your roll cast, just when you stop at one, don't tip back to two or three and then go. That's going to put slack in your line and it's going to kill the tension you have. So hold directly at one o'clock. Make sure you have a solid pause so you can get that water tension. Go straight from one o'clock, straight forward, 
give it a little extra tension with that single haul and you should be able to get that over and lay it out. Um, let's see, looks like Yvonne's getting some of these answered. All right, so moving on from kind of some of the tip tricks um, let's talk a little bit about strip, strip set. So let's talk about stripping styles. I've said it multiple times. I'll say it again. You are the personality behind your fly. I need you to get that personality in the fly. Know what you're imitating. Know what it looks like in the waters you're fishing and try to make it look natural. Um, like we talked about a little bit ago when I was just talking about retrieves, you can go consistent versus intermittent strips, long and short, smooth versus jerky. Um, I think somebody asked earlier about kind of tip movement, um, especially if I'm on the boat and we're close to the bank or I'm just not doing long cast, I'll give it a little tension through my line, but then I'll just do a little wrist jerk to get my tip moving to kind of move that streamer through. If I'm in closer quarters or I'm close to myself and I can't strip more, I might just give it a few little tip jerks in order to um, kind of finish out that retrieve. Um, positioning of hand and angle of strip. So let's talk about this for a minute because this is super common. Um, people will come into the shop or just over the years of watching people strip um, for various reasons, streamers, whatever. They'll come in and on the bottom side of their reel, they'll have a little indentation where the line, because the line might be textured, is eating into the metal. Um, what I tell people is when you're stripping your fly and your rods here in front of you, you're going straight from here to your hip. So it's a good solid line. Um, a, if you're going up or you're going down, um, it does create a little twist in your movement. It does present the fly differently. You also, a lot of times, don't have as quick of a return if you need to strip set really quick. So consistent straight line, reel to hip when you're actually stripping back. You can also go to the two-handed strip. If you've been saltwater fishing before and you come from a trout territory, you've probably had a saltwater guide make you do this so you don't trout set. Essentially what you're going to do is you're going to go into your haul, you're going to lay out your fly, you're going to put the actual um, rod handle and reel under your arm, and then you can use two hands to actually strip the line. Um, it creates a little more movement in the fly. It creates a higher speed um, depending on what you're fishing for. I've used it for pike quite a bit. I've also used it in the salt. Um, but if you are somebody who nymph fishes a lot and you catch yourself missing fish because you're strip setting and you're trying to actually set on the fish, you cannot physically set this way. Um, you have to strip set. So it's a great learning tool as well. Um, bumps and strip set. So strip set again is just the technique you actually use to hook the fish. You're stripping, you're stripping, you feel that bump, you give it a good set and you're setting that hook in the mouth after the fish has inhaled the streamer. Um, the bump is the action of the fish actually coming up and hitting the fly. Um, so essentially what's happening there is the fish is coming up, they're trying to disorient their bait, they're gonna hit it, they're gonna come right back and they're gonna get it. Um, a lot of people will be like, I got the bump, but what do I do? How do I handle that? Um, I tell people, don't stop stripping. Feel the bump, keep stripping. Your next strip, give it a hard, you're probably gonna set on the fish at that point. Um, it's just a natural, it's what fish do, like I said, to disorient the bait. Um, so it's just, you're gonna feel the bump, give it a hard set, Fish is usually going to turn right around, grab it after it disorients it, and you'll set right on that nice fish. Um, let's talk a little bit. We're just wrapping up here, but let's talk a little bit about fishing conditions. Um, so wading versus floating versus still water. So wading, obviously you're standing in a fixed location. The fly is coming directly at you or away from you. Um, the biggest thing to know about wading is just that, you know, you need to adjust. So you're going to need to take a couple steps. Um, you may not work a run like you would when you're nymphing, where sometimes when we're nymphing, we work, you know, <clears throat> 20, 30, 40 drifts. And it's on that 41st drift, suddenly the fish takes it because we adjusted our, you know, something, whether it was our weight, our flies, our depth, whatever. Um, with streamer fishing, you're typically clearing water a little bit more. So you're not going to do 40 casts in the same area. Um, you may work the water still, section it. Um typically like maybe in versus out. So you're going to work closer to you and then you can work out. Um, but once you feel like you've worked that area, you probably have. So take a couple steps down, take a couple steps up, whichever way you're moving and um, go to the next section of water. Um, floating. The biggest thing with floating is the person behind the oars has an effect. Um, I know floating has become really big in Colorado, which I'm total support of because it's absolutely my favorite way to fish. I like to row almost as much as I love to fly fish. 
It's a big deal in my life. It's important to have somebody on the oars that actually knows what they're doing. And not just for streamer fishing, by the way, but for general safety, because we do have white water in Colorado. Um, but the ability of the person to manage the boat based on how you're fishing and retrieving is really important to balance. Um, we can, if you have more questions about that, feel free to shoot me an email. I can talk about it more in depth. We don't necessarily have time for it today, but just know that the oarsman's capability will highly impact your success streamer fishing from a boat. Um, still water, you can obviously fish it from a boat or the shore. Um, shore fishing requires um, improved casting ability. So you're typically in still water trying to get out far enough to get off of a drop or a ledge to then retrieve back or to get to a color change um, or a mud line. So the ability to, again, to get that haul in, um, be able to fish in, in and against the wind, because you typically want the wind kind of blowing towards you for the chop when you're on still water is a big deal. So dialing in that casting stroke and that casting skill is gonna be really important. Finally, we'll wrap up with some cold weather techniques. Um, anybody who follows me on Instagram or has been to one of my presentations knows that my motto in fishing um, is not only that I fish streamers, but there's no such thing as streamer season, period. Um, I fish streamers year round 365. I don't care if it's sunny, it's cold, it's warm, it's snowing, it's whatever. I'm probably going to have a streamer in the water. Um, so just remember where a lot of times, especially for those of us in Colorado, the cold weather will come and we'll get out our midge boxes. We'll start tying our size 24 midges. I totally fish those too. Absolutely nothing wrong with them. Don't discount other types of fishing, including, stream, including streamer fishing. You can have as successful as a day of a day streamer fishing in cold weather as you can in fall or spring when that's what people are like, oh, it's spawning season, fish are aggressive, I'm gonna get my streamer out. Um, just remember that bait fish, they're in the water year round. There's not a streamer hatch, they live, they're there. So there is no such thing as streamer season. Um, the biggest thing in cold weather is just to remember trout are affected by constants and changes. If we had a big temperature drop or a storm rolled in or a front rolled in, and now we're three or four days out and it's been constant in temperature and weather, the fish have adjusted, they're moving again, they still have to eat. Fish need to eat. So get out there, put your streamer on, you might adjust the size or the color, you may look at adjusting your presentation as far as slowing it down to match fish movement and metabolisms, but at the end of the day, they're still gonna eat the streamer, so just fish it, because there's no such thing as streamer season. So. With that, I will leave you with that bit of grace, glory, and recommendation is to get out, to get some streamers in your box. If you haven't fished them, let us know. We'd be happy to live chat with you about it. Um, my email's on here, so you're welcome to email me questions. Um, I will definitely get back to you um, in between healthcare chaos right now. Um, I'm happy to get you any summaries from this presentation or answer any questions you may not have been able to ask today. I'm going to finish up a couple of questions really quick in our live chat if you have any last ones, um, and then we will.